Now we have a panel discussion on the holy grail of SEO and SEM. Brands are increasingly using the power of SEO and SEM, which are really two sides of the same coin. But they consist of very different actions and relate to different aspects of marketing. So what works best for brands in ensuring the maximum ROI? We have invited a panel of industry stalwarts to answer every question. I would like to welcome Abhinav Chaturvedi, partner Deloitte India, to moderate this discussion. Over to you, Mr. Chaturvedi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. To all the listeners, viewers, wherever you are in the different parts of the world, uh, welcome to this uh, session. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting one. Um, before we begin, my name is Abhinav Chaturvedi. I'm a partner with Deloitte the India. I'm based out of Mumbai. And uh, today I have with me an esteemed panel. Uh, they will introduce themselves, but I can tell you that each one of them brings uh, you know, the best out of uh, the digital marketing domain. And the topic that we are going to cover today is something which is on top of the mind of every marketeer, or in fact, every CEO. Uh, this is the topic of uh, uh, SEO and SEM. And as you can imagine, as you might already know, this is something which has turned the world of marketing and sales upside down in the last few years. Uh, the whole new term of performance marketing has emerged. Uh, which means a lot of things to a lot of people. And today we'll try to get a sneak peek uh, of, on it from the best of uh, the minds in this business. So I will just quickly uh, call on to my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. So we could start with Tarun. Off you go. Thank you so much, Avinav. Uh, my name is Tarun Jha and I'm responsible for marketing at uh, Skoda Auto India. Thank you, Tarun, and welcome to the panel. Uh, Mayur, you could go next. Hi, uh, my name is Mayur Patak and I manage e-commerce uh, at Titan I Plus uh, in Titan Company. Thank you, Mayur. Uh, may I ask uh, Jahid to introduce himself? Hi, uh, the entire panel. Thanks for having us once again. Uh, my name is Zahid, and I take care of the entire digital marketing for HDFC Bank. Thank you, Jahid. And last but not the least, Rohit. Hey, hi, everyone. Hope you all are doing well and keeping safe. Uh, thank you for having me uh, as a part of this panel. I am Rohit Dosi, and I take care of the Microsoft Search uh, business at Inmobi. Thank you, Rohit. So... Without wasting any more time, let's jump right into the topic. Staying in the topic of performance marketing and uh, going slightly deeper. See, one thing which most of the people struggle is what KPIs they should actually use uh, while, perform while, while you know, doing performance market marketing in different, uh, for different techniques. So what has worked well for you the best? We chase two kinds of KPIs through performance marketing very clearly. Uh, one is on the brand building side where we look at brand awareness and brand, uh, you know, familiarity. Reason being that uh, Shkoda has been a fairly niche brand in the country. And as we expand our network, and in the last one year, we have doubled our network and we have gone to new cities where we were never there before. So for us, brand awareness and uh, brand familiarity become important KPIs to chase on one hand. On the other hand, of course, other you know, core sales-related KPIs of lead generation, which is very important in the automotive world, and test drive requests. Those are the key KPIs that we chase through our campaigns. Thank you. So, um, but if I, uh, what would be interesting to see is the other side of the story. So if I can bring Rohit in and uh, just ask him from his business vantage point, what do you suggest to your clients uh, on what are the best KPIs to be followed for performance marketing? I think, see, there is one KPI that rules everything, right? At the end of the day, it's profit or ROI. That is something that, you know, needs to be taken into consideration uh, when it comes to bridging, you know, the business objectives at one side and the, the return from marketing investments, right? But I think 
I think now more than ever, right? It is important to decide goals or KPIs for different channels as per the stage of the marketing funnel that you are trying to solve with that specific channel, right? So I think user now needs to be nudged from one stage to the another, uh, you know, where he is from one stage of the marketing funnel to the another. And I think having a single goal uh, and, and, you know, fixing that goal for every marketing platform would not be the best thing to do. I've had the luxury or privilege of, you know, seeing journey of a lot of brands in terms of, you know, how they're spending across, uh, you know, marketing spends. But I think, let's say if, if it comes down to matrix, right? Matrix, right? Then, then it, it would be CPCs or CTRs or some businesses, right? Uh, they will definitely want to understand who are their return visitors, what's the customer lifetime value for say, let's example, right? How do they get, uh, you know, more new users? So whether it's it's the cost of, cost of customer acquisition of, of a new user or a returning customer. Now, now when, when it comes to, uh, you know, all of this, right? I think the competitive benchmarks, uh, you know, that we suggest brands to, to kind of establish would not be the same for everyone, right? So let's say for known brands, probably they might get a higher ROI because they have already spent a lot and built a certain level of brand awareness and consideration, right? But for the smaller ones, they might not be able to get the same, uh, you know, return on investment when they start off. And, and I think from a, from a SEO point of view, particularly, I think gaining the top spot is necessary, but then if you're not able to get that, then that is where SEM comes into play. And then probably you can kind of, you know, spend more and get the top spot. So yeah, in all, I would say, uh, you know, that, that ultimately everyone is looking for a return on, on, you know, the dollar, dollar that they're spending into marketing platforms, but then the platforms are also positioned very uniquely in terms of, you know, what is the stage of the marketing funnel that they're solving, solving for. And then accordingly, brands will be fixing those unique KPIs uh, when they invest their marketing spends. And um, uh, I think Tarun mentioned some specific KPIs which are relevant for his industry. For example, lead generation, uh, number of test drives. So Jahid, if I could ask, can, do you see some parallel in, in your uh, industry? Are there any specific KPIs or generic KPIs that you see which are working well for you? You ask a digital marketer about KPIs, I think it's... Uh... So digital marketing is all about KPIs, right? See, what happens is the way we have evolved the digital marketers is we have actually, we have identified the need for each of the funnels. If you see a classic sales, when the team member talks to his boss in a classic sales scenario, he says, today I'll be closing 10 units or this month I'll be closing 10 units. The very next question the boss will ask is, what is your pipeline? Okay. Now, this is a part that generally gets missed out in the era of digital marketing. Because digital's advantage at times comes its disadvantage. Because everything is trackable, people think that means, okay, that means everything is performance. Okay, so I think what we have evolved slowly over a period of time is we have identified the key difference, which Rohit was also suggesting, is okay, what is the part of the campaign which is supposed to build a brand? What is the part of the campaign which is performance? Now, these two, everybody is doing it pretty much seamlessly. What we have done is we have tried to create a mid-funnel. That is, how do I create a pipeline for bottom funnel? Okay. And what is the measurement matrix for that? Okay. Now, that is, so predominantly, the whole word is called nurturing, or it's also called creating consideration. Okay. So how am I creating a funnel, which is, and how do I also convince senior stakeholders that I'm considerably using a sizable amount or whatever amount is it in kind of convincing people that you should start considering our brand if you're all already considering a product for that particular category. Okay, so that's also, that's, so that's something which is called lead nurturing. We have started getting into it. Okay, and we have our own metrics for it to consider and a assisted funnel understanding that these kind of metrics for mid funnel is finally, that might, they might get converted from a SEO, SCM or any other bottom funnel stream. Okay, but how is that helping us in assisted conversion from the direct last click attribution? is what we have actually built in to understand the impact of this mid funnel as an end funnel. So we, we are talking about two things, the SEO and SEM. Okay? Right. And uh, obviously both of these are related. Uh, but uh, uh, is there a way if you if you feel that, you know, by improving, obviously we know that in theory that improving SEO quality will uh, help me reduce my SEM pricing. Uh, what's your experience with that? So I heard the question that you asked that um, SEO or SEM is better, right? This is like asking, asking a mother, which kid is good for you, right? So I think they are, they are like, you know, the two, it's, it's like Karan and Arjun for any digital market. We cannot live without that, right? Now, see, and they give and take to each other brilliantly, seamless. Okay. 
So what it happens is when we do, uh, uh, like if I just take a step back, the, from the entire SEM is, see, SEO is, a, is built over a period of time. So we cannot do too much of test in terms of which keyword we should go for, which ad text or which meta tags or title description we should go for. So what gives as a quick feed, like a elder brother, let's say, is SEM. We know which keywords we should target for. We, we know which ad texts are really working good. So that means those ad texts can, can be considered as a good title description and meta description, meta tags. Okay. So this pa passing off, so we can do draft and experiments on SEM. We can take the learnings, pass it to SEO. Okay. We can do a lot of personalized landing pages on SEM. So we know which content is really working for them. Again, get the learning, pass it to SEO. And that is where SEO evolves. Now, wh where SEO comes handy? SEM, let's say a majority, like let's say for a brand like us, where the brand search itself is so high and we have to cater to it so that we can get maximum share of voice to avoid competition coming and bidding over there, a lot of budget can get consumed for the downstream funnel. So SEO really helps us in creating the mid funnel and long tail query keyword. Let's say if I'm talking about something called a personal loan, if I take just take two minutes to just kind of detail it out. Okay, HDFC bank personal loan. I will never, I'll bid on it, though I know that I'll be ranking number one in SEO, but I don't, I won't, I don't want, I don't want competition to come and bid for it at that point of time. So I want maximum share of voice, very high on intent. But let's say somebody is kind of typing, uh, what are the ways to get out of bad debt? Do I want to bid over there or do I want to support with a content article six ways to get out of bad debt? Where I subtly plug in personal loan, maybe. So we have very clearly identified the, you know, the mind map. What are all the questions? Because people don't get up in the morning thinking of banking transactions. You know, we are an enabler to people's aspirations. Okay. So what are those aspirations and how people will slowly start thinking of us as a product or as a service? When should we take them? Right. So we start thinking of that without moving away, without straying away from the lens of money, we start talking about it. So all these kind of mid funnel and top funnel content is driven by SEO and all the bottom funnel, when then they, they read about it, the intent is high, the intent for the brand is high, we start bidding in for, uh, for the SEM page. So that's how we kind of complement each other to ensure that the entire spread is covered and we don't have to spend money for the length and breadth of keywords. And I think Tarun, you were trying to come in on that one. No, no, I completely agree with uh, what was said just now because uh, both go hand in hand. And that is what I was trying to say that, you know, you can't ignore one over the other. Both have a role to play the SEO. Uh, we use it to leverage the brand's pool and the SEM for the category pool. So uh, you have to find the right balance, uh, like it was mentioned here. And that's what I was trying to say. I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, thanks. And uh, so, uh, yeah, as as uh, as you can expect, so SEM um, the KPIs are much simpler to measure. You can just go by by a cost per click or you know uh, pricing uh, based on clicks. Uh, but SEO is more long term and requires a different set of KPIs. Question is around uh, KPIs for SEO and uh, you know uh, the role of SEO is to drive traffic to the website, right? And uh, hence organic traffic is uh, the end goal of SEO and that's what we track. But lately what we have realized is when we are running campaigns or uh, improving the uh, rankings of the keywords, right? Earlier we were just looking at the number of keywords we are uh, improving on, right? So we have identified a list of keywords, how many keywords we are ranking on top one, two, three, right? Uh, but what started happening was uh, when you're looking at only the ranking, uh, there was a mismatch between the kind of traffic we are getting and the number of keywords that we're improving. Because a lot of keywords are moving into number one, but traffic was not improving in the same uh, pace, right? So uh, we moved our interim metric from number of keywords to actually uh, the share of search uh, voice that we are able to get. It means that the number of keywords that are ranking in top three, what is the total volume of uh, those keywords? and how many searches are happening in our domain or category. Right? So this uh, has given us a little more uh, context to when you're looking at just the number of keywords, uh, what is the actual volume of those keywords. Uh, now what we're doing is moving the keywords where uh, volume is very high and focusing on them. Right? So that is one intermediate metric and final metric basically 
for us is uh, traffic. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, um, Mayur, if, uh, if I could just stay with you. Um, so, we talk a lot about uh, first party, uh, first party uh, customer marketing data, you know, and uh, most of the organizations, they don't realize, but they are sitting on a wealth of information. The only problem is nobody knows where this information is and uh, they don't have the tools and processes to use that information for any meaningful purpose. So, in your experience, in your organization, how are you using first party data and uh, what, what do you feel are, are some of the key enabling factors which, which can help others? Sure. So, like you mentioned, we also, we are a legacy company and we also had the similar problem a few years back where uh, data is sitting in silos, right? Uh, we're generating a lot of data, but no one knew how to combine it and how to use it, right? Um, we have very, very strong uh, cross-business loyalty program where we acquire a lot of customers from multiple businesses that we run, right? So we have jewelry business, we have watches business, eyewear business. Uh, through this, now we're able to identify uh, the demographics data, the geographical location of the customer, the transactional data, and on top of it, a lot of uh, uh, you know data which is getting generated at the store, uh, which is... Uh, just by observing the customer, you know, we are able to put, for example, uh, I particularly run eyewear business. Uh, if a customer is walking into a Tanishq store, right, and if he's wearing a spectacle, I can just, uh, uh, you know, look at that customer and in our, uh, uh, you know, database, I can just put a tick mark saying that, yes, this customer is wearing a spectacle. So that gives us a context to that data. Okay. I need not reach out to everyone in our database. Those who are wearing spectacle are my customers, so we can reach out to them. Uh, over a period of the last three years, we have brought all of our data together, put it into a single view of customer. We're using Salesforce as a uh, platform, which is aggregating all of our data. Uh, now we are uh, getting into a next stage where we want to implement a CDP where uh, you know first party data we can uh, utilized to run better uh, in our online campaigns. So uh, that's on the more on the consumer side, but uh, see, sometimes we joke that uh, you, your bank knows you the best. Yeah. So the bank has basically all the data about you and, and they can, I, I mean, sometimes it's scary how much they know about you. So Jayat, if I could ask you, uh, how are you using the first party data? And are there any, so obviously there will be some regulations which stop you from using the part, the data in a completely free way. So what, what's your experience on that? That's obviously, uh, I like your statements. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I think, um, yes, we, we, by the virtue of the business, I think uh, we know, but that is very, very restricted to only us. Okay. Now we might use it for uh See, there is no data exchange happening anywhere whatsoever. Okay, that is only used. Now, let's say when we have a, let's say we have a population. So my, what we generally say is my digital branch, which is my website, has got the highest traffic coming in, footfalls, up to, let's say, around 70 to 80 million a month total visits coming in. Okay, so we use our own properties to personalize for our customers. And that is where we use structured and unstructured data in a model where we can personalize the offer, personalize the communication and show, because see, our website is a what a, a conglomeration of, let's say 5,000, 10,000 pages, right? How do I know, like you might have your own intent, but if I can predict the intent basis on your digital behavior, basis on your uh, you know need that I can establish uh, with the models that's running in, how can I personalize the communication? So there is an aspect of product personalization and there is an aspect of communication personalization. Okay, so this is what we are trying to marry and uh, roll it out across owned and maybe an extension of other platforms, which is very significant for a good business generation. Sure. And uh, see, as uh, I, I, can, I have also seen that a lot of this is becoming competitive differentiator now, right? So the way you manage data, and the way you manage your customer experiences uh, using this data is becoming a competitive differentiator. So Tarun, um, if, if I could ask you, uh, see, in, and in this, just extending my question. So when we say, uh, you know, a lot of companies had started outsourcing data management in different shapes and sizes. So either the analytics function or the 
the storing of data or the data lake, they start, started outsourcing. There was a wave of doing that. But now it's more about controlling data because, as I said, it's it, it can make a huge lot of whole lot of difference in uh, the kind of experience and the kind of uh, products you provide to your customers. So, in your experience, uh, is that a trend that you are seeing that more and more data management functions will be uh, insourced? Yes, in fact, yes. Uh, we are also on that journey uh, because, see, geographically, we are present in about a hundred countries in the world. And we are in this phase of transition where a lot of our markets have already started internalizing all the data. And the two things that we have to you know, keep in mind when we are doing that is one, it is uh, in terms of infrastructure, it is uh, pretty investment heavy. So companies have to keep that in mind that you know it is investment heavy. So second point is that you need to build an in-house team of talent. Because hitherto, we were still operating with very lean teams and most of the work of this sort was outsourced. But everybody has started realizing how important data is because data is the future, even for very old fashioned businesses like ours, because you know our business is still an old fashioned business compared to e-commerce for instance. Not that automotive has not got into it. We are, so we are straggling, let's say almost uh, you know, 130 years of business and we are present in practically every decade in the last 150 years and we have certain practices which date back 120 years also uh, but data like you said is the new oil as people say that companies have realized that and i think it, it would not be a surprise that almost everybody in the automotive business is trying to consolidate this in-house because it's the future it helps us in running our business efficiently for today and it is also a stream of business for tomorrow. And that is the most important thing. And as you know, automotive is not you buy a product and you forget about it. The whole ownership journey of a customer can last you years and years, followed by another car, followed by another car. So it's not a one-time data usage that you're talking about. It's actually that you are connected and tied to your customer for a very long period of time. And obviously the intent is to keep the customer in the family and then keep selling them more and more new cars. So that's how important it is. And automotive business has woken up to that fact. Uh, you are so, so right. So uh, it, it is, it's no longer about using data for one particular transaction or uh, for a, uh, it, it's more about extending the lifelong relationship with the customer. So uh, if I can bring in uh, Rohit, your view on this. Uh, so see, the other trend which we, have been seeing uh, is consolidation of sorts when it comes to platforms, systems, uh, vendors. And uh, instead of going with very pointed focus solutions, a lot of companies are now thinking of fewer platforms, fewer partners, uh, because of precisely this reason, how you break the silo between data residing in different uh, systems. So anything, any trend that you are seeing on, um, uh, on this and how, uh, again, the, the struggle there, the biggest impediment that comes there is the, the whole culture within the organization. So anything that organizations can do to break this culture or change change the culture of silos? So I think, I think we are in an era of connected consumers, I would say, right? I think everyone is engaging, uh, you know, with brands every now and then, right? So, so I think, first of all, it is important for brands to be present across multiple channels, right? To ensure that they are kind of engaging their customers. But I think for, for the marketeers, right, it is, it is also very important to have a centralized view of, you know, what is happening, you know, have a, have a more coherent view of what is happening in their customer journeys, you know, what are their customers doing at multiple touch points. So I would say, key, I would say that, that the problem for a CMO right now is to have a 360 degree view, right? That has become the largest challenge. Right. And, and if they are not able to have end to end view of, you know, what is, what is happening with a dollar that is going inside in the marketing funnel and what is it that is coming outside, right. It becomes very difficult to evaluate, you know, are they investing in the right platforms or channels, right. So that is why we have seen a digital shift happening with respect to the marketing platforms also that are available out there. So I think if you see a lot more marketing platforms are moving towards doing everything. I mean, we, we used to have, you know, say performance marketing and brand marketing before. Right. But I think those lines have blurred now. I mean, I mean, we have seen, you know, brands talk, not, don't talk about performance and branding anymore, but it is about marketing 
for them right and and that covers you know from from their media spends to to let's say uh, you know their data uh, you know coming in uh, in the pipeline to you know multiple other things right and they are kind of you know tightly integrating you know uh, spends across all and and you know uh, calling them as marketing spend so i think when that shift comes in from the brands right the platforms also need to move into that direction you of kind of solving for a cmo right and therefore i i would say the platforms were offering a more integrated uh, you know plat uh, integrated solution are the ones that brands are also preferring i mean no one wants to probably work with 100 platforms out there right uh, figuring out what happened in which right but probably they might want to work with you know a fewer platforms who are kind of you know giving them a coherent view of what is happening with their marketing platforms so i would so there is you know this uh, you know we work with a lot lot of brands right and a classic example that i would uh, give here is that people are now using search advertising for creating brand awareness right? i think i think we were discussing about seo and sem right so let's say if if you know uh, users are searching for you right and you are able to manage the top spot using seo it's great right but in case if that's not happening right then people are actually bidding on a lot more keywords which are you know closely or remotely related to their brands probably they might not be branded keywords but a lot more heavy on non branded keywords so that they can gain the mind share of of the customers who are out there and in turn the right traffic because if they are able to create recall finally somewhere they might be able to nudge that user towards towards the end goal right so so i think uh, you know people are using search for branding and 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 i think uh, you know particular platforms solving for a particular goal is not uh, you know happening anymore i think people are being a lot more innovative i think i briefly touched about using data for personalized experience right uh, so i think uh, you know people are using data for creating personalized messaging or or you know nudging uh, users or customers at specific funnels using different platforms thanks for so rohit you spoke uh, you mentioned uh, running ads on brand keywords so i just wanted to ask mayur if uh, that is something that uh, that they do so do you run uh as a brand do you run ads on brand keywords uh as a brand uh, sometimes we do run ads on our brand keywords and see basically what happens uh, when someone is searching your brand this customer has very high intent and loyalty towards that brand so is uh, most likely to click on the organic results right uh but the problem happens when a competition is coming in and bidding on your brand keywords and taking away the impressions or traffic that you are supposed to get right so it's a debatable to- topic about uh, should a business run a uh, brand uh, keyword ads right so a lot of people have view that yes we need to protect the brand uh, but uh, you know in our case uh, when our competition is not running the ad and if we run the ad uh we are not get, getting any incremental traffic or revenue out of that it is just the the organic traffic getting converted into a paid traffic but when a competition is running the ads and uh, we have to counter that and ensure that our brand is protected right uh we run that that's when we are able to save the impressions that are going to the competition on our brand keyword right mm-hmm. so um what we are now trying to do is uh, uh, see it's very difficult to identify competition is running ads when where which uh, uh, geography which exact keyword right so we're trying to automate this part whenever someone is running keywords on our brand keywords our ads will automatically trigger if no one is running we'll stop so i think that is where uh, the, you know we have found a sweet spot where uh, we're protecting the brand when someone is actually taking away the impression and when no one is doing anything you're saving that money to invest into other keywords so th- that is how i see it okay and uh, tarun if i could bring you in on this point um any views on that no i think you summarized it uh, brilliantly well and i completely agree with that and that's how i think most of us marketers are doing it these days uh, of being cautious and not being wasteful i think that is the message that we have to be uh, you know very cautious because you know everybody has limited budgets and that's we have to be we have to be very clever about how we use it and not end up wasting it because it's very easy to waste money you know yeah. you do it because we all want to do everything that's yeah. the problem with marketers so for us to hold ourselves back i think is the biggest challenge for it and um, especially in your sector uh, the automotive sector the uh, there's a huge shift in the way people uh, have you know consider 
uh, people explore products and you know uh, uh, finally make the purchasing decision and also the shift in uh, your uh, potential buyers so it, it's shifting more towards gen z and you know in the next uh, 8 to 10 years those will be your buyers so uh, and there i am sure you must be making these decisions every day on how much budget uh, how much funding to put on uh, immediate uh, short term goals versus how much towards long term 8 to 10 year kind of goals any thoughts on that how are you how you are doing that so the one thing is that 8 to 10 years is still a very long uh, view uh, for our business although we have to have it because now you see with government regulations coming in and the way the automotive uh, business has been disrupted over the last let's say 2 or 3 years there'll be more changes in the next 10 years than there were in the last 50 that i can guarantee you both in terms of the products so we start with the product itself uh, we know the shift that is happening from internal combustion en engines to electric engine you know uh, in the next 10 years in all probability most of the countries including india by 2030 would be fully electric i think that's how the government sees it as as sees it and that's how we also are keeping a view on that uh the other thing is the customer again the evolution of the customer and the way the customers perceive this whole category has is changing dramatically uh the car is no longer a mode of travel alone so in india uh the cars were obviously uh, cars still attract the sin tax and uh, most people can't afford it and that's the reason why we have one of the lowest uh, penetration rates in the world but for the new customer uh in the next 10 years most of the products would be fairly parity products as i see with electric the differentiation would come from the brand part of it and the experience part of it because cars will cease to be just a mobility solution cars are becoming devices now and that is how the young people perceive everything is a device car would be a device which also transports them you know with connectivity with cars that can practically perform everything that your mobile phone can these days including entertainment the amount of time that you spend inside the cars will facilitate your life so the cars would serve as reminders cars cars would serve as your as your office apart from being a mode of uh, transport of course and that is how we have to evolve and understand the customer and we are doing it on a continuous basis to see how the young people would interact with that and that also brings in another aspect of you know renting versus owning because as you know a lot of young people don't believe in owning stuff the older generation our generation for us buying a car was a major sign of arrival you know it was a car was an accessory which you bought to show to the world what you were doing and you know through our careers when we upgrade our cars it's a subtle message that we give to the world of what you're doing and how successful you are and on the other hand it is also a reward that you're giving yourself for doing well in life the young people don't see automotive as a reward they see it as a tool and that will be the biggest shift for which we are preparing yeah well said and i think uh, yeah that's a great point on the ownership part especially in the last one and a half years uh, because of the pandemic Uh, uh and a lot of surveys that we conduct show that the mindset of consumers is now shifting from ownership to to just consumption i mean how can you take it as a service because nobody people are uncertain about the future it might change again in 6 months that's how human nature works but right now it is like that uh so uh, one thing that you also touched upon and i think um, others also spoke about was around personalization now there there is one uh, very practical challenge which is about uh, what we call as the cookie less world which is now impending so uh, so for example recently uh, last year google announced that they are going to disable third party cookies uh, on their browser and similarly there are others or who are also about to make similar kind of uh, changes uh, in that case how do you see personalization happening right so right now all your personalization depends on the third party cookies which are stored in the users browsing device whether it's mobile or so maybe i uh, i could bring in uh, uh, rohit if i could bring you in on that point first and then we could go around the room i think see personalization is 
is important, right? But then the right question is how much personalization is too much personalization. So it starts to freak out people also, right? So so I think a balance there is important. I think with, you know, cookies going away, et cetera, right? I think there are still a lot of data points that, that you know, brands are collecting or have collected over years is what I would say, right? And I think while it might not be, you know, uh, I would say, let's say, personalization to the extent that is happening now, but I think there are enough probabilistic, uh, you know, attributions and conversion modeling that are going to kick in, right? Everyone has a lot of data. And I think at some point in time, the data is going to talk to each other, you know, in a more seamless way, right? And I think uh, there might still be, there is a lot of element of personalization still possible. There are innovations in with respect to, you know, the messaging or targeting, et cetera, that has already started to kick in, right? Uh, I think, brands will innovate and platforms will innovate and figure out newer ways of, uh, you know, doing that. I mean, we have seen iOS, um, the IDFA go away, right? But but I think there is still like a lot of innovation uh, happening. We've not really seen, uh, you know, conversion rates, et cetera, go down for brands or platforms. I think uh, it's still out there. So I think innovation will also happen at a very fast pace and personalization will become a very uh, important part of, uh, you know, how, how you know, uh, the ads are being showcased to the customer. And Jahid, uh, if I could bring you in on this point, uh, anything in your experience that you're saying or how you are preparing for this kind of eventuality? So I think, you know, um, we, we, have, uh, we, uh, we have enough first party data and we are gearing up for more how to showcase the first party data on our own platforms, right? And what can be the genuine extension of it? I think it, it gives a good control to the customer to kind of uh, take control as to where all he wants to get personalized offers, what, what he wants to see. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I think I think what Rohit kind of touched based upon. If you ask, nobody has the right set of answers, but in our own means and ways, we are just getting kind of ready to get customer consent, uh, first of all, from our point of view. Uh, and along with customer consent, what are the possible parameters that we should just restrict ourselves to showcase to? Uh, Mayur, your, your views on that? Because I have another question for you, Mayur. Sure. So uh, I think uh, uh, what uh, Zaid touched upon and we spoke about, the first party data will become one primary source of personalization for a lot of brands. Along with that, um, the platforms that we're using, right? So, um, uh, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, they have a lot of third-party data. So, a lot of dependence will come on the, uh, the AIs of uh, those systems, the personalization through those systems, and uh, put together the advertising platforms plus uh, your first-party data will lead to a change in the way personalization is happening in the future. So, we touched upon the point on... Um on uh, partnerships and, you know, um, external vendors and platforms. Um, but is there anything that you see in general as a shift in the whole MarkTech ecosystem? Where do you see it moving? So a lot of marketing technologies will shift to uh, uh, go beyond uh, the existing sources of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ac acquiring customers, right? So. Uh, a lot of uh, new uh, ad tech is coming up where you can show ads on the browser itself, where it's not really like a ad. Uh, on the keyboard, uh, there are suggestions coming in which you can, uh, you know, before a customer is actually searching on Google, uh, the keypads are showing you the results uh, sh uh, from uh, the relevant brands that are running ads. So a lot of new sources or avenues of advertising will open up. Like glances come up with, you know, uh, on zero screen, you can run the ad. So these are a few changes uh, that we see. Uh, merging of first party and third party data uh, and, you know, both the things working very closely together. That is another emerging trend which will become stronger over a period of time. And, uh, you know, the existing data will start you know, coming together very closely to deliver very, very personalized experiences to the customer. Uh, third, uh, and personally for us, which we want to do because now we're at a stage of scaling up is uh, the technologies which are helping us identify the uh, fake or bot clicks and then uh, also ensuring that uh, it's getting blocked and campaigns are getting optimized and you know it's stopping the impressions on such websites or not showing so a lot of uh, 
corrective measures technology is taking automatically. So it's it's filtering out and improving the kind of targeting that we are doing, which eventually will lead to improving the kind of audiences that are coming, and hence uh, the ROI is will improve. So these are three important uh, uh, future changes that I see. And you spoke about ROI. Um, so uh, any anything from your experience on what works better? Uh, any advice for others who are trying to figure out the ROI uh, for, um, for 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 the whole performance marketing bit, including SEO, SEM. So how do you justify? It? You know, we started off with this point at the beginning of the call, but yeah. maybe uh, that could be a good rounding up. So extremely difficult because attribution is a very very difficult science, and you know, uh, a lot of uh, times people get into this that okay, I spent this much money on this particular platform, how much customers did I get and what is the revenue? And I just feel that is a little restrictive for the brands uh, because you'll not be able to see ROIs on every click and uh, on a specific medium. Customers travel through multiple sources to your platform and come uh, make multiple visits and then make a purchase, right? So, uh, but in most cases, we have seen SEOs have uh, slightly better ROIs than any other customer acquisition platform that is because you have built a brand plus you uh, are visible on the top of the pages right uh, the problem with seo is you cannot scale faster on seo right uh, further if you go beyond uh, we've seen better ROS coming where we are able to marry the seo as well as sem together right so uh, from SEM, we are able to identify which are the high converting keywords, which are the pages which are converting when that insight gets into uh, the SEO and we are able to build new landing pages, we are able to create a lot of content and we are able to improve the rankings of those pages. So combining these two together will give you better ROIs. Looking at platforms in isolation is I think not the right way to look at the ROIs. Absolutely. And Jahid, I think in the sometime in the beginning of this session, you mentioned that SEO and CM are like Karan Arjun, so you can't differentiate. But any any thoughts, uh, any insights on somebody who's trying to actually find out a ROI for these two separately? No, I think I, you don't need to. You don't need to. And uh, as you rightly said, we have to have a very specific objective in mind. Are we so confident of the brand that competition cannot make any inroads on my brand-led keywords? If we are, Try not to bid for the brand keywords. Okay. But but what happens is your competition might get strayed away. You know, different school of thoughts. Okay. Why do your why do you want your competition to get strayed away with some very fancy fintech ad offering an astronomical offer, which actually, when you go to their terms and conditions page, there is nothing. So then you again come back to us. Why do you want the customer to stray away? So might as well bid for that brand keywords. Very different school of thoughts. Okay. And as I was telling you. We are trying to evolve in a process. Generally, initially, people used to kind of, let's say, bid for more generic keywords so that they can build on a funnel, ensuring SEO will take care of your brand keywords. Okay. We are trying to also take a reverse mapping to it, like let the generic and core keywords, and see, people are consuming content and long tail with Hummingbird coming in. I think long tail key keyword query uh, is a brilliant way where people are getting their content, whatever they need. And there is no restriction in whatever you are typing. Okay, how do I ensure which is the best credit card for me? Okay, in a paid ad, what will happen? How do I ensure which is the best credit card for me? That means he wants to have a card comparison. You will take him to a form factor. There is an absolute mismatch, right? So hence, this is the place where you should take him to a content where you, I might, I might throw him light with multiple card options, right? Uh, he might say that, okay, what are the documents needed for applying a card? I take him to a form factor, start applying. So these are the places we know I can really take care of content and SEO. And then when he's convinced, so generally, you know, we have a two by two matrix. It's divided between intent and decisioning. Intent means he has an intent to buy the product. Decisioning is when he has decided which brand he wants to go ahead. Okay. So when his intent is high or whenever we are trying to nurture him in the intent phase, Let's talk about, let's get SEO and the long tail query led SEO at a much higher growth. Okay, let's write more content and get involved, indulge in content. When the decisioning is high, let's not allow him to stray anywhere else. Let's get him bang on our platforms and, and let him consume the journey. 
Okay. And because we today, when we are doing end-to-end -end business, we can attribute each and every business that is coming. It is coming from, and, and the attribution is not only last click attribution, we are actually trying to establish a full funnel attribution model. So what was his first click attribution? What is his mid funnel? And then finally he got last click. Eventually we will see last click is either via SEM and SEO. And uh, we have seen an incremental growth. It's not that, you know, that SEO traffic is completely taken by SEM. Whenever SEO, SEM comes in, there is a 15, 20% uptake on that. Okay, that's for sure that we have noticed. But, and, and eventually, yes, search will be the end funnel for most of the cases. Okay, but the impact that the other channels will play to give boost of a search, you know, is this phenomenal. A, a very typical case, just one minute more on this is, let's say some other display channels, you know, if I have to name it, like let's say it can be Facebook, it can be Discovery, it can be Programmatic, okay. They might not give you direct conversions, though Facebook and Programmatic has evolved to a way, if I optimize properly, it can give you direct conversions also. But if, if let's say for X amount of booking, you are burning Y amount of impression, have a look at your search query growth trend. Your growth trend in search query is increasing and that's nothing to do with search. That is completely because of the visibility campaign that you're doing, though they are also performance led. So it's a very good ecosystem that goes hand in hand and eventually it leads in search. That's how I think we can kind of look at it, yeah. Thanks, very interesting views, Jayad. And uh, Tarun, maybe some quick uh, reactions from you on that one. No, so I completely agree with Zaid also because you know you, the kind of uh, massive digital universes that have been created by you know let's say Facebook again and all that. Uh, I think it works hand in hand. It's not either or situation. Zaid you know, summarized it beautifully, which is I was continuously shaking my head in agreement with him. Zaid, well done. I think you have uh, said exactly what we all believe and uh, wanted to say. So I completely agree. That's how it, it, it is for us in our industry, which is very different, actually. We are just out of time, but uh, uh, what we would do is we will just close with uh, one, uh, uh, my, my pet question, which is to all in all such panels is one big prediction about the topic in hand uh, that they see, which will emerge in next uh, three to five years. So Rohit, if I could start with you, one big, big prediction. Sure. So, so I think uh, personalization and vernacular, right, is is going to be the next thing, uh, right? The searches are not going to be like just text-based. I would say it, it'll probably, you know, voice will kick in, right? And and then, you know, vernacular personalization will go to, uh, you know, some another level. So personalization and uh, you said vernacular, vernacular uh, adaptions. Okay, thanks, uh, Karun. So he uh, highlighted, Mayur highlighted three of them. So I agree with two of them. In my, in my opinion, I think uh, vernacular is very important. We've already embarked on that journey from our side. And uh, the other thing is voice. Voice-based search is what's going to really blow up. Absolutely. Voice. And uh, Jahid? Since after a long time, we have been talking about SEO in specific. I think, you know, guys, obviously, Rohit, Tarun, you covered the main key points of it. To add to them, CRO, CRO is taking up big time. Conversion rate optimizer from SEO. Okay, for the wider viewers, have a look at it. What is it and implement it. It's brilliant, okay. And multimodal search, recently Google has come back with. So image search, multimodal search and CRO. Try to get these three also apart from vernacular and voice. I think that kind of get your SEO in the best place. Thanks, Jai. And Mayur, closing thoughts from you. So in fact, um, you know, uh, two of the panelists spoke about it and I also feel uh, vernacular is going to be big and in fact, uh, September had a Hindi divas and we launched our Hindi website during that period. Uh, we believe that uh, you know a lot of traffic will start coming in from the local languages across the country and we are moving into that direction. And certainly the voice. So these two are going to, in the next two, three years, uh, take a lot of shape. A lot of traffic will come from this and businesses should be re ready to ensure that they have technologies which are helping them get customers who are talking to the devices or who are uh, typing in their own languages. And, you know, that's where you'll get a lot of incremental traffic. Thanks, Mayur. Um... With that, I think we are at the end of the session. So if anybody has any closing comments, please pitch in. Otherwise, I think uh, it was a great session. Um, lots of topics we managed to cover in a short time and hopefully 
the listeners will have a lot of gain, lot to gain from these uh, insights. So thank you all of you. Thank you everyone for delving into this and sharing your point of view. Time for another session. Stay tuned and keep tweeting using the hashtag ET performance marketing.